Is the New Testament reliable? Many skeptics seek to undermine the historical credibility of the New Testament and doing so undermine the credibility of the Christian faith. One book that's under assault recently is the book of Acts. How do we know that the book of Acts is historically reliable? I'm joined today by Dr. Travis Campbell, a Christian scholar, to help answer that question. If we can show that Acts really is a good uh, historical document um, that is generally reliable on everything it affirms about history, then I think that you've uh, taken one step closer to accepting uh, the general reliability of the New Testament as a whole, and also you strengthen your case for things like the resurrection because, after all, if Jesus can be shown to have risen from the dead on a minimal facts approach, then what about a maximal data approach, as Lydia McGrew calls it, where we show that Acts, for example, is replete with historical references that have been verified. How do we know, then, that the book of Acts is historically accurate or is historically reliable? Well, the book of Acts, uh, whoever wrote the book of Acts, uh, was also the same person who wrote the gospel according to Luke. And so Acts is really Luke 2. Uh, it is the sequel. Um, and I think that, first of all, in terms of the dating of the book of Acts, um, I think it's pretty clear that Acts was written before the year 70 A.D., so I would date it um, in the early 60s, uh, before the death of Paul, before the death of James, and before the death of Peter. Why? Because those are the three major characters in the book of Acts, and yet nowhere does the book of Acts mention their death. Now, I know this is an argument from silence, and so critics of what I'm saying here are going to say, well, just because it doesn't mention the death doesn't mean it was written before it's very hard to conceive of the um, author of Acts not mentioning their death when they're so central to his case for Christianity, when they're such central characters in his book. Why would he not mention their deaths if he was aware of them dying and how they died and so forth? Also, the fall of Jerusalem in the year 70 was such a piv pivotal event for Judaism and Christianity that it's almost inconceivable that the author of Acts wouldn't have mentioned that event, especially since in Luke 21, Jesus predicts the fall of Jerusalem in, uh, that eventually happened in AD 70. Well, some critics might say, well, look, uh, Luke is mentioning the fall of Jerusalem after the fact by putting that prophecy on the lips of Jesus. Remember, critics don't believe that God inspires people, and so... Uh, the Gospel of Luke was written after 70 precisely because Jesus is predicting it. But here's a question. If Acts was also written after 70, you would think that Luke would record the fall of Jerusalem or allude to it as confirmation of Jesus being a prophet sent by God. The very fact that Acts doesn't mention that strongly indicates, in my estimation, and in the estimation of other scholars, that Acts was written before the year 70. And once you have Acts written before the year 70, and since Acts is a sequel to the Gospel of Luke, Luke also must have been written before 70, say in the mid-60s. And since Luke is generally considered to be the third Gospel, that means Mark and Matthew also must have been written earlier. So the early dating of Acts places all of that Gospel material within the first 20 or 30 or 40 years at the most, years uh, within Jesus' death, um, and within the gen first generation of the um, apostolic college. Now, beyond all that, there's strong internal and external evidence that um, the book of Acts is historically reliable. And here I would recommend the book by Colin Hemer, entitled The Book of Acts in the Setting of Hellenistic History. Also, Craig Keener, in his four-volume commentary on Acts, uh, notes time after time, both Keener and Hemer, note time after time in which the book of Acts is vindicated by archaeology. Luke gets it right every time that we've been able to check him out. My favorite example is in Acts 18, we have Paul going to Corinth, and he's met up there by two characters known as Priscilla and Aquila. Well, Priscilla and Aquila, were, it was, we were told, had to flee out of Jerusalem 
because of a ban on Jews in Jerusalem. Suetonius tells us that uh, in the days of Claudius Caesar, Claudius put a ban on Jews living in the city because a controversy broke out, riots broke out over the identity of one named Christus. So we have what apparently was a debate going on over the identity of Christ in Jerusalem, and thereby all Jews were sort of exiled from the city. They were expelled from the city. And Priscilla and Aquila were two Jews who fled to Corinth uh, during that time. And so Acts 18 is corroborated by Suetonius. Also, we have, we have an archaeological discovery mentioning the fact that Gallio was proconsul in Achaia uh, at the time that Paul was living in Corinth. In fact, uh, Gallio presided over um, a trial that Paul was a part of, and it's all recorded for us there in Acts 18. And so the very fact that Luke gets it right time and time and time again in Acts indicates that we can trust even what he says that hasn't been corroborated. I'll say one more thing. What is more important to Luke, the life of Jesus or the life of the apostles? Well, to ask the question is to answer it. Clearly, the life of Jesus is more important. And so if Luke is this meticulous in recording all these events in Acts concerning those that are less important, how much more so can we trust him when he's talking about the life and teachings and events surrounding Jesus' life, which admittedly can't really be all that corroborated because Palestine is a far more localized and um, separated area than the various areas that Paul is traveling to around the Middle East.